Hi, I'm Mark Smith. Uh, I'm a sociologist. I'm here at TEDx Bay Area. And I'd like to talk to you today about um, some opinions, some ideas that I've been having in response to uh, the explosion of information about our behavior, uh, which I find fascinating and I try to study. Uh, but there seems to be in the growing web of sensors and devices um, uh, a certain assumption about how information could be private, uh, as if it could be private. And when I thought about doing this talk for Tatiana uh, a few weeks ago, it was before the revelations about secrets, um, before the secret that we have no secrets was a secret, uh, because it's no longer a secret that our secrets are not secret. Uh, and so in some ways the context of this talk changed and a lot of people uh, went it turns out and got their copy or ordered a copy of 1984. And I did what any uh, internet user would do. I found somebody who had it for free on the web. And then I searched through it and I started thinking about telescreen, the word telescreen. And somewhere in there I must have switched windows and I was looking at some like sharper image catalogs or some tech reviews and I came back and I started looking at what was in 1984 and it sort of read like a really um, disgruntled product review. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Uh, th this could be considered uh, Xbox One telescreen zero. Um, how to go better than Orwell. So the user's talking about their use of their flat panel display and they're saying that the problem was that it didn't work in darkness. And that's a real concern uh, because of course there is darkness because they have power shortages. Uh, only the telescreen gets powered, they don't get heat. So uh, I just wanted to point out that the good news is that Xbox One, uh, it works in complete darkness. Oh, that's really good, right? It can actually see you in complete darkness. Uh, it can tell all of your motions. That's really good. Uh, so we, we're, we're a better than Orwell. Um, there's that great moment where um, the protagonist of 1984, Winston Smith, uh, is uh, engaged in quantified self-activities. He's doing calisthenics. He's getting his healthful activity in. And he's being encouraged by this persuasive software agent. And uh, of course the problem is it's an actual human. It takes a lot of time, it doesn't scale. And so we should note that Xbox now can tell when you're actually doing that deep bend from a mechanical point of view. So uh, two points that we can do better now. And uh, of course there is this issue that you can manage your face work. You can try to compose yourself. But giving away your heartbeat, it's just really hard. And thankfully, um, uh, you couldn't control that. And indeed, uh, Xbox now is measuring your heart rate. Um, so that's handy. It's good to know that your heart is going at the right rate. Um, and then there's this notion that uh, the telescreen didn't work very well because it couldn't really read your face. Uh, people had to, and it didn't scale. And so you never knew if you were under surveillance or not. And the really exciting thing is the new uh, facial expression engine on the Xbox One, which actually can tell whether or not you're looking at it, and if you're smiling, and if your heart rate is elevated, if your eyes are open. And so, uh, you know, the, the fact that um, the Xbox One is coming certainly means that it's coming to my living room. Uh, I have a 17-year-old. I'm sure we're buying it. Um, but, you know, I'm glad that it's better than the telescreen. Um, so what I'm concerned about, though, is not just that the data exists, but that there really now has to be the acceptance that it's in no way protectable that there is no possible protection, that almost all your bits are belong to us. Um, our government has made it very clear that uh, a lot of very specialized people are going to overcome every form of security there is. Uh, zero day bugs are out there and really nobody's going to be able to have a computing system that's hardened against it. Uh, I note that today there was a vote in the Congress and we didn't defund uh, the surveillance state. And you know, in some ways I, I'm here to say don't. 
because if we don't, then the other guys are likely to be running their surveillance state against us. It's not like we only tap our phones, we also tap their phones. It's not like they only tap their phones, they also tap our phones. So what if computer security is an oxymoron? What if data security doesn't exist? What if selective sharing is a myth? What if the namespace that exists on the internet is only one namespace and all your bits are belong to us? It's just an interesting thought because, you know, I had a Fitbit and I was going to show it off today, but it turns out that I washed it again and it doesn't work anymore. And so, uh, you know, I'm interested in getting all the gadgets. I like the gadgets. And, you know, there's this moment in Milan Kundera's Incredible Lightness of Being when uh, the secret police tell him that they will no longer be surveilling him. And he's lonely. He misses it. At least he knew someone cared. And so it's great that these things exist, uh, but you know, if you haven't seen the ACLU pizza uh, video, you have to see the ACLU pizza video in which ordering a cheese pizza with extra meat gets you into a lot of trouble. Uh, but you know, this is coming in a different way. Uh, I'm gonna propose that you will likely soon get a phone call when you order your third glass of Merlot, and it's gonna be your health insurer. And your health insurer is going to say, we love seeing you out for the evening. It's what life's all about. But you've just violated your terms of service. You're no longer in bounds for your contract. You have a blood alcohol level over the legal limit. Now, it's okay. Press one to assess a $20 surcharge, and we're going to let you have that alcohol infraction for the evening. Uh, but press two and decline coverage. And by the way, if you wrap your car around a telephone pole on the way back home, we don't cover you. And so the idea of quantified self, or as I like to call it, the intimate scrutiny movement, um, gives us this new opportunity to ensure health in the same way that the calisthenics ensured that the members of Airstrip One kept limber. Um, Novartis is offering a product that tells whether or not you took the pill. Insurers are tired of paying for treatments that don't work. Healthcare is expensive. If you can be made well, then fine, but you have to take the pill. And so, um, and they'll know if it's the blue pill or the red pill. So, uh, prediction, uh, the most powerful drug on earth will be an app that makes you take your medicine. It'll be more powerful than any medicine because it'll make you take your medicine. And how will it know and how will it get compliance? I'm sure there will be gamification involved. That was something that was missing from the telescreen. They needed more gamification. They only had sort of, you lose a life or you keep playing. There was no way to move up. So, you know, there's goodness out of all of this. I mean, surely there is, because uh, Google Flu Tracker is telling us things that we don't know. That's a good thing. Uh, but we are being invited to imagine that there is selective sharing, that there is a way of storing some information that only some people will see. And that seems like a really dangerous idea. It's as dangerous as the things I used to do as a kid when my family would go on long car trips and I would lay in the back window with no seatbelt on because that's what you did. So let's talk about risk. We're going to live very public lives. I mean, very public lives, like like lives of the Middle Ages where an omniscient deity actually heard every word. We're going to live those lives. We're going to re live recorded lives. And then the data won't be protected. There won't be any privacy. There can't be any privacy because the full force and power of the federal government of the United States of America ensures that there won't be any privacy. And I believe those guys are good. I think they can pr crack anything you've got, so much so that I give up. No more computer security for me. All my bits are belong to you. Um, so let's think, maybe it's actually not the case that it's just bad government or other people's bad governments. What if it's actually a law-like property of information? Now we've heard a lot of debate about information wanting to be free. The glib comeback is that information wants to be expensive. I think it wants neither, but I think it wants something. I think it wants to be copied. I think like DNA seems to be really good at copying itself. I think bit patterns 
don't like there to be just one of themselves. I had kids, I kind of know what it's on about. Uh, so what if the whole point of information is that it duplicates itself, including your most private bits? And let's face it, it's not just our bits that we're having trouble keeping under wraps. Mr. Snowden shows that he can get at all sorts of people's bits, even the people who don't want their bits. If Mrs. Clinton cannot keep her email private, I don't think I can either. And so maybe it's the case that we should just all accept the idea that information wants to be copied, that there really isn't a capacity in computing for selective sharing. Or maybe we should put it this way. There was a long history from the time that, let's say, steam engines came on the scene and started to be used commercially to the time when they stopped killing people routinely. In other words, we mastered a power enough to make it useful, but not enough to make it safe. And if you think about bits, bits only become more public, and therefore, over time, they only have two destinies. I don't know of any bits, and maybe, you know, tell me, any bits that ever, having become public, became private. I thought it was interesting that uh, members of the Homeland Security Administration of the United States are, not in, are instructed not to read the Washington Post because it might have slides that are now confidential. Uh, they're not confidential anymore, right? And they're never going to be any more confidential. They're only going to become less confidential. I'm sure that the rest of the slides will someday be in a bit torrent for us to all download. So they only move in one direction. So that means they either die before they become public or they become public. And that includes, well, there's only one exception. I, I like to think that there's Smith's Law of Information. And that is that the only bits you cannot find are the ones you need right now. And the only bits you cannot get rid of are the ones most embarrassing to you. And so if information's always going to become public, because no matter how you secure it, uh, the reality is that there's always a link that's easy to break. We don't have to break your cryptography. Uh, I think there's a good comment here from XKCD. Um, yeah, you know, it actually turns out that we're both building the multi-billion dollar code cracker, and we have a wrench. So the cryptography people have been a disappointment. I'm sorry, you, you have. Uh, didn't work out, and I wanted it to, because I actually want the idea of selective sharing. It was a cool feature. It was really neat. But every time you see the thing that says you could limit this post to uh, your friends or a selected other, and I think you've seen the meme that went around where it said you, your friends, and NSA. So it, it's a joke now that those bits are certainly not going to be protected. And certainly cryptography is not going to protect us. So, um, you know, in the physical world, nobody really believes that. I mean, nobody tells you, hey, we've got the safe that can't be cracked. Uh, if I understand it, safes actually have numbers on the side and the numbers are the number of minutes or hours that they will resist being opened. Not, and it's never infinity, right? You never see just that. It's always 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, it's never gonna be forever. And so if we don't expect it in the physical world, and we, sh we really shouldn't expect it in the virtual world, we're getting to the point where, as I understand it, um, you know, you could change your name on different network services, but you're probably going to friend the same people, or at least a subset of the same people. And so I could find out who you are. Is Bob Robert? You can find the answer to that question. Uh, there's some research now that says all I need is to have the location of your mobile phone at 2 p.m. and 2 a.m. That's a unique signal. Only you are in those two locations at those two moments, or very few other people. You may work with the spouse. Could happen. It's very small. So, you know, the idea of anonymization um, is, it seems, a dangerous idea. And, you know, there have been dangerous technologies before. Uh, in 1834, a steamship blew up, killed more people than anybody had imagined could die at the same moment. And it kept happening. Uh, these steam engines kept exploding until about the 1930s. It's about 100 years of exploding steam engine. Um, Look at hotels with their, um, I, I like this, uh, it's a, the advertisement for the hotel and it says fireproof hotel. And you think, is there another kind? Can I have the fire full hotel? But it turns out you could build buildings big enough to get lots of people in them, 
but not build them so well that they wouldn't burn to the ground and kill everybody in it. And it took years. The sprinkler was uh, invented in 1816. Uh, it took until the 50s until it was a requirement. Um, safety belts, long history, right? Uh, 19, what, 10 cars are getting popular. When did you actually start clicking your safety belt on in the United States? What, it was the 90s somewhere in there that you actually started doing it and you didn't just laugh about it? At this point, I, I, you know, I give in. I would never drive a car, it'd be like getting in the car naked. I would never get in the car without putting on the safety belt. I, I believe in the safety belt. But there was a time where I believe my family was driving down I-95 at about 80 miles an hour and I was in the back window. And nobody thought that that was a problem. So. Uh, I think our theme here is that information that isn't private uh, or, or that isn't public is about to be. And so think about that when you record all of your health data. And I'm for recording my health data, and I think it will have value when it's aggregated. And the good news is if you record any, it will be aggregated. Um, but I think we have to believe now that this myth of selective sharing is in fact just that. It's a myth. Uh, the feature doesn't exist on the platform. And it's sad, because I kind of like that feature. But that's my belief, and that's my talk. Uh, I think, uh, there you go, some conclusions for you. Uh, don't build things that have selective sharing features anymore, because they're going to break and they're going to hurt your users. And even though you think that you're an engineer, and I'm, I bet a lot of you are talented engineers, uh, I'm going to say even steam engineers have not yet mastered steam engineering. Ask the people in Fukushima, they are having some steam engineering problems. So maybe we should just stop trying to put steam under pressure. And in this case, it would be bits. Uh, assume public by default, uh, and just note that mitigating technologies take about 80 to 100 years. So uh, and it turns out insurance companies are the heroes. Who knew? But insurance companies make us all reduce risk because they won't pay anymore. So that's how we wear safety belts and have fire safe hotels and uh, steam engines don't explode anymore. So uh, with that, there you go. Uh, why I'm not that delighted with uh, the quantified self movement, uh, at least as is, uh, or uh, another way of thinking about it is the myth of selective sharing. Thank you.